So my name is uh, Rabbi Aaron Greenberg. I'm the Canadian Director of the Orthodox Union Jewish Learning Initiative on campus. It's an organization uh, that's actually based out of New York, and uh, we service about 24 campuses across North America. I work as well with you know, young adults in the Jewish community. I spend time also with, at York University and Ryerson University, and we partner with the local Hillels across uh, North America to work with, the, uh, with Jewish students in order to provide them with a sense of uh, religious guidance, community building, uh, social programming, etc. Okay, so I think the most fundamental question we have to ask before we can get into genetic editing is where do you know, the balance between playing God lie? So there's a fundamental precept in the Bible that uh, human beings are created in the uh, image of God. Uh, but if God has no image, what does that mean? So I think what that really entails is that we don't have anything fixed. We, we have these notions that we are fixed, that we have notions that things are predetermined, but the view in Judaism is no, is that you can actually change things. You can enhance things, and you don't allow status quo to remain. God tells Adam, I'm giving you the world, but it's your responsibility to improve it and enhance it. How do you survive? When it's cold, you human beings need to create heat. When it's wet, we need to provide structures and so on and so forth. And the Talmud says that God gives doctors, God gives people an ability to try to enhance things. We don't say, oh my goodness, you know, um, I broke my hand, so therefore God did that, and therefore I shouldn't try to fix my broken arm. I mean, that's absurd. That is not a Jewish concept. It's not a Jewish ideal. In fact, it's antithetical to Jewish ideals, where we say no. The fact that you have a broken arm, or you have a heart attack, or you have cancer, or you have whatever the case may be, or you have a taste actually of genetic disease, it is our responsibility, it's our obligation to try and say, wait a second, we are not governed by nature, we have to rule over nature, we, have to, we can't abuse nature, we have to realize that nature is there for something for us to enhance and improve the lives of human beings. In Judaism, a parent has a responsibility towards their child. And therefore, a parent responsibility is what will I do to best, what my child, what would they want? If it's something which is beneficial, it's something, then it's my responsibility, obligation, to help out my child. And therefore, what child would not want to ensure that they don't have some type of genetic mutation or to some type of scenario? And therefore, it's a parent's responsibility to do whatever they can uh, to try and help them out. We're not interested in rights, we're interested in responsibilities. And so the question we ask ourselves is, what is your responsibility? Um, and responsibility as a parent is to try to ensure that their child, their fetus, it's not a child yet, it's just a fetus, is going to be healthy. And so whatever it takes, you have to do it. A conflict? I mean, there could be a cost issue. <laughs> you know, it could be very, very expensive. It's not covered by, you know, the, the medicine, the medical world that we have here in Canada. Um, and so the question will be, how much does a person have to go into debt and borrow in order to do this? That could be an issue. The other issue will be about abor aborting. Um, if they discover perhaps a genetic mutation, abortion um, can be a challenge. Those would be some of the concerns. Um, and again, the question will be, once you're already, shall we say, tampering with the genetic code and the genome, you know, how far can you go? So you ha always have to do a risk analysis. What's the risk? Right? What are you are you going by helping and curing area A? Are you perhaps hampering area B? And so, are you better off doing that? So this already exists. Um, there's actually a rabbinic figure in Canada who sits on one of the ethical boards. In um, he's based in Ottawa, um, and you know in America this is very common where you have certain rabbinic figures play very large roles in government ethical agencies. The governments are often looking towards religious leaders for to help shape and guide ethical policy. And I, mean, I would argue that having the proper Jewish religious leaders would be a good thing for the Canadian government or for any government because they do take in consideration a lot of different factors which I think would be beneficial to society. There's no question I think it's important for Jews to be involved in civic discourse. I think they have a, a very important role to play. They've always had an important role to play. I think they always will have an important role to play. Uh, and I think, um, I think it's important that we 
voice our opinion and take an active role in trying to ensure that the ethical policies of our government, of our country, um, you know, are proper and moral and ethical and are actually taking into consideration a number of different issues that, again, maybe perhaps not everyone in the Canadian population is interested in, but I think it's an important voice to have and it should be brought to the table. Right, so look, there are a lot of Jewish doctors out there. You know, I, I, I can list, you know, 30 in a, in a hundred, in a, in a moment. You know, I, I, I pray to synagogue. I'm very involved in the community. Um, and I often deal with a lot of medical issues uh, as well. And, and, and therefore, I need to consult with doctors dealing with a lot of issues of Jewish law that you need to have more medical knowledge on. And, and that's been the tradition in Judaism for many years, is that for certain issues, uh, medical issues, whether it deals with uh, Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, we just had a fast day not long ago called Yom Kippur, in terms of who can fast and who cannot fast. And these are very serious questions. We take these things very seriously. And therefore, a, um, a rabbi who needs to make these decisions needs to consult with the medical team exactly what the issues are, what are the matters are, and what are the health concerns and what are the health risks, and, and then come up with a, with a decision. Rabbis need to know what's going on with their medically. I mean, it, it's very important. And I think it is something of value, especially when you're talking about enhancing lives of human beings. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. Um, and it's so vital uh, to the world that we live in. Um, and I think we live in a world sometimes who don't appreciate religious leadership. But I think if you have an opportunity to speak to religious leaders who are thoughtful and who are caring, I think they have a lot to provide the world that we live in. If you go back, we have uh, met, we have questions of Jewish ethics and medical ethics that go back hundreds and hundreds of years on records in literature that have been writing up. This has been going on for over 1,200 years, and we have them all recorded. Many of them recorded, they're in Hebrew, so they're not always accessible to everybody. Um, and so we know that rabbis have always been dealing with, the med again, the medical issues of their time, you know. 100 years ago, no one's going to ask them about genetic editing. I mean, that's absurd, right? So all these have always been questions that the Jewish community has always had to deal with. And so they've always needed to be at the cutting edge of medical technology because they're always dealing with these questions. And so because Judaism placed a tremendous value on life, um, therefore, any time you can enhance the life of somebody, it is something that... Uh, they generally will embrace. Cosmetic surgery would be a great example because cosmetic surgery is cosmetic. How can you permit cosmetic surgery when there's a risk? That being said, sometimes, again, this is where things get very complicated, is what might seem to be cosmetic, we know can have a tremendous impact on a person's well-being. So if we can argue that while this is technically cosmetic, and again, this is what's complicated, you know, but there's still a benefit to maybe a person's appearance, self-worth, self-value that will help them get married, get a job, get up in the morning, then one could argue that even cosmetic surgery could be permitted. So that would be an example. Okay, so do we allow cosmetic surgery under certain conditions? So could we, could we allow cosmetic genetic editing? You could even argue that under certain conditions, maybe you would even allow it. The question is, what's the motivating factor? So why are you doing it? What's its value? What's the risk? What's the benefit? What's the cost? And once you could really have an appreciation for all that, then you have to make what is the right ethical decision. But to completely make a blanket statement, this is all permitted, that's all forbidden, that's all immoral, it's, it's much more complicated than that.